Okay, you're back with me to talk about columns and chromatography. What more exciting time can you have in your life besides me, you, and this conversation? Whether this is a Saturday night or whether this is an early Sunday morning, who knows? But thank you for making the choice to listen to me at this time. All right, so we need to talk about the column, and we need to talk about the column in more detail as far as it concerns chromatography and how chromatography works. And the column is really one of the most important, and I'm going to write that on here because I think that is important to say and to note, but it is one of the most important pieces of a chromatography system. Now, a couple of these columns can be handmade, all right? And that's actually what you're going to be doing in the laboratory for us at some point in time. You're actually going to hand make your column, if you haven't already, and you're going to be analyzing a sample on a handmade column. And that will show you how these columns used to be done, such as Michael Tisfet's day when he started looking at his pigmentation patterns. However, most of the columns now are ordered, and they're ordered from a company, some type of column company that we can just simply call up and say, this is what we're doing, and this is what we need, and could you send it to us, please? And then they're like, yes, for $1,200, it'll be on your way, and then we'll receive it in the mail within three to five business days. All right, so that's the world of column chromatography nowadays. It's not making it in the laboratory as you need it. We really order them as we need them and as we need to replace them. Okay, so I first want to talk about a handmade column. And the reason I do this is because you are eventually going to start off, again, if you haven't already, learning how to hand make a column and the most important pieces that go on the inside. Okay, so I'm going to draw basically some type of glass vessel that will look like a burette here, but it's not really a burette. It's actually called a chromatography column. It's a little bit different than a burette because it doesn't have the line markings on the outside for milliliters, right? The burette is what you've used the titrate with. It has these line etchings on the outside, and the burette column does not have anything like that because you don't need it. That's not what it's used for. But it's shaped very similar to a burette column. Okay, and it has a stopcock down here at the bottom. Uh, the first piece that I want to mention uh, is the piece down here at the bottom, and I'm just going to kind of draw a layer that's going to be right here, all right? And I'm going to name this layer as a frit. Uh, now, I can order these chromatography columns, just the glassware only, and I have to pack it, which is what we're getting ready to talk about. And if I do that, then some of these will come with what we call a frit. And this frit is basically just a surface that is very porous, and it allows the liquid to flow through, but it doesn't allow any of the solid stationary phase to go through. So imagine it in a way kind of like a filter. It's filtering the liquid through the chromatography column, but it's not allowing any of the solid particle to come down here and clog up the stopcock or to clog up the tip of the burette. So we call that a porous frit. Now if it doesn't have a frit, the next best thing to put here is a piece of cotton. And you'll actually be using a piece of cotton when you pack your own column in the laboratory. And the cotton does the same thing. Uh, it is very porous, so the liquid can go through, but it's going to prevent any of the solid from actually escaping through the cotton and into the burette tip or into the stopcock itself. All right? So on top of the frit or on top of the column, we're going to have another layer. And this layer, I'm going to draw a different color. And this layer is actually a sand layer. Now, that's what you're going to be using when you pack it. However, in an actual column, they use a different type of material that's similar to sand, but not exactly sand that you would find at the beach, right? So the purpose of the sand is just to make sure that everything is level, right? Chromatography really bases itself 
on sample going in at the same time and sample going out at the same time. And in order to achieve that, you have to have a level playing field. And that's the purpose of the sand layer, at least on the bottom. So it allows things to kind of come out all at once, and it provides another barricade for the stationary phase so it doesn't go through the column itself. On top of the sand layer, we're then going to have a variant of levels of stationary phase. Uh, these can be as tall as they want to be or as narrow or short as they want to be. But this is going to be my stationary phase of the column. All right, And that's my adsorbent. Now, we talked about adsorption. So this is the adsorbent. And the adsorbent in chromatography, if I pack it myself, is typically a silica or an alumina-based uh, stationary phase. Now, there's hundreds of different stationary phases that are out there for me to choose from. And if I'm using equipment or instrumentation, such as HPLC, I'm probably not going to be finding columns with silica or alumina. But the very first lab that you will do with us, that you will hand pack like this, will either be alumina or silica. And that's why we talk and start talking about this version first, because that's the first version that you're going to be seeing. Okay? So stationary phase can vary in height. And then what happens is that I typically will come through and I will put another layer of sand on the top. And again, the purpose is the same. It is to level everything out to make sure that my sample goes in all at once. And then that's basically packed. I now have a column that's ready to go that can actually take a sample from me at this time. All right. So the way that this column will work when I hand make it is that in the beginning, what I want to do is I want to make it wet. All right. So in goes my mobile phase and my mobile phase can be typically anything it needs to be. I'm going to talk a little bit about the pairing up in just a second, but my mobile phase here is probably going to be some type of organic solvent when I do this by hand. All right, and we'll talk about why and we'll talk about how a little bit later on. But my mobile phase goes in and this mobile phase will actually go through the column and it will make everything wet on the inside. The first thing that you want to do is make sure that there's no cracks in the column. Okay, Cracks or bubbles are very, very bad. And you will not get very good separation due to this if you see those. So when you put the mobile phase into the column and you start to see your column crack or break apart as far as the stationary phase goes, or if you see bubbles begin to happen in the stationary phase and you get these air pockets, these are very, very bad. You might as well just trash the column and you might as well just repack it because you're not going to get good data and you're going to get tattled on at the very end if you think that you can sneakingly get by with it because you don't want to pack another column, right? It takes a couple of minutes. That's all it takes. So a couple of minutes to repack it is going to save you hours worth later on if you decide to go through and do the separation and not get good data as an end result. All right, so the mobile phase goes in, no cracks, no bubbles, everything goes wet, and then I'll start to see drips that happen down here at the very bottom. When I do that, if I'm ready to inject my sample, I'll just continue to let the mobile phase kind of go on through and almost go directly into the sand layer, all of it, right? So I'll let it seep, 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 seep slowly into the column. And when that mobile phase gets to the top and about the rest of it goes into the sand, I'm then going to put my sample on top of that. Now the reason that I do it that way is because if I put my mobile phase in the column and I allow this column to fill up with mobile phase and then I put the sample on top of that, well my sample is just going to swim around in this big pool of mobile phase up here at the very top. 
And I don't want that to happen because that means a little bit's going to be sucked into the column and then a little bit later is going to be sucked up in the column and then a little bit later will be more sucked up into the column and I don't want that to happen. I want very good separation. So I want all of my sample to be into the column at the same time. And the way that I prevent all of this trickle that can happen is that I allow the mobile phase to go all the way down to the sand layer and then when that gets ready to go into the sand then I put my sample on top of that very quickly and then my sample will suck down into the sand and I wait until the majority of the sample has been entered into the column and then on top of that I will hit it with more mobile phase and that more mobile phase will continue to push the sample through the column and allow the separation to take place so I can collect it down here at the very bottom. That's the proper way to pack a column and that's the proper way to extract your samples from the column. It's very important, right? If you do this process the wrong way, you're going to get tattled on because your numbers are not going to be get very good. Your separation's not going to be very clear. You're going to see multiple bands of the same color in the sample and in the stationary phase, and you never want to see that happen. All right? So frit or piece of cotton at the bottom, then the sand level, then the stationary level, then the sand le level, then mobile phase. Get everything wet and keep adding mobile phase until you start it to see drip down here at the bottom. If everything looks good at that point, you allow the mobile phase to basically suck all the way down into the column. You top that off with your sample. Allow your sample to be sucked almost all the way completely in the column. And then you top that off with mobile phase and you keep adding mobile phase at that point until you get all of your components off the column that you want to keep. So that's the handmade packing of the column. All right. Now we do have a picture. There's different um, burettes that you can use or that you can choose. Uh, and here is an example of one of the chromatography columns that you might see. in a laboratory. And let me zoom this up a little bit. All right, so uh, here is basically uh, different versions of a chromatography column that you would pack. Uh, up here at the top, uh, this is a traditional chromatography column that you're seeing. Again, I told you it was like a burette, and it looks like a burette with no markings. And then up here at the very top, you see a bulb, right? We call that the well, the mobile phase well. And this allows you to kind of flood the column with mobile phase and keep it going so you don't have to refill it with mobile phase throughout the process of separation. So it lessens the workload on you a little bit, but that's the purpose of the well up here at the very top. Down here at the bottom, you're going to basically see the same thing, except this is a shorter chromatography column, and this is perfectly good to use, right? There's no difference here than that one. This is just a little bit shorter, and the separation, if it's simple, can take place much quicker in the shorter column than it can the longer column. Here are big, huge vats of chromatography column, right? Uh, so this is the frit that we were talking about in the in just a couple of minutes ago. You can kind of see the frit in the small one as well. Uh, but this one is made to hold more stationary phase and it's made to hold more sample. So these are going to be larger sample throughputs. Uh, and we just typically don't use that ourselves. We don't have a need for this size. We actually don't have a need for these larger sizes either because the lab that we get you to do is a very simplistic lab that only has a couple of colors in it, and that is it. So one of these little short ones would actually work for us better than some of these bigger ones. Uh, the chromatography columns can actually go 
much, much larger. So here you see more variants of the chromatography column, just in different sizes and different widths, some with wells, some without the wells. And then over here to the right, you can actually see how large some of these can get. Uh, so here's a chromatography column with a woman that's standing beside of it. So again, it depends on what you're doing with it. Uh, what's going on in the laboratory, what kind of samples are you processing, you know, what's happening here. And that's why you choose the different chromatography columns that are out there. What we will be doing, though, is kind of like this slide that I maybe showed you a couple of videos back. And this is just a glass pipette, right? That's all that that is, one of those dropper pipettes. That's it. That's all we need. And then here in the bottom, uh, you probably can't see it that well, but there's a piece of cotton. And then on top of that cotton is a small layer of sand. And then you see the white area that's here. And that white area is going to be my stationary phase. And then on top of that, it's going to be a little bit of sand again. And I can see some sample. It's kind of greeny color in the column itself. It looks like this person's already extracted the yellow color and the green color's coming out now. But that's kind of the column that we're going to be actually assembling in the laboratory when we do our very first lab. All right, so that's what we want to see. Uh, if you want a, a closer look at the tops and the bottoms of the column, here they are. Uh, so there's the cotton that you see down here at the bottom. And then here's a small layer of sand. It doesn't have to be very large. Just make sure you tap the edges to make sure it's level. And then above that is this white looking stuff. And that's my stationary phase. So the stationary phase goes all the way up to the top. And then here is my sand layer. And that sand layer, again, I just tap, 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 make sure it's level. And then I see some mobile phase that's sitting up here on the top. If I'm not using the column for that particular day, I want to make sure that this stays wet if it has already gotten wet. So what I mean by that is if you want to pack the column on one day and not put any mobile phase in it, it will be good to go tomorrow. You can then put your mobile phase in it, make sure there's no bubbles, make sure there's no cracks, and start separating your sample. However, once you make this wet, it has to stay wet. It cannot dry out. So if you're kind of getting to a point where you're adding mobile phase and you're doing the separation, you really have to go from that point on all the way through the rest of the lab. There's no stopping point that you can do. Once you get it wet, it has to stay wet, and you have to keep getting basically the mobile phase drip out of the bottom of the column, or your column will begin to get ruined. Now here's a bigger picture of a bigger column, right? And it just kind of goes through the steps that we've talked about already. So down here is the frit, and then the stationary phase, and then a little bit of sand and sample up at the top. Uh, drip, drip, drip into a container that sits down below. And then up here is my mobile phase well that will hold my mobile phase and it's ready to go when I'm ready to go with it. All right. Uh, so again, one of the things that you got to keep in mind is never let the column run dry. So once it gets hit with mobile phase, it has to continue to get mobile phase until you're completely done with that column. If not, the column's typically ruined and you're going to have to completely start all over with your lab experiment. All right. Okay. So that's a little bit of the column and that's a little bit of the diagrams and the pictures of what you would see, especially in your very first lab uh, and some kind of tidbits of information about how a column begins to look on the inside, right? Uh, a lot of times when we get to the equipment, some people just simply don't understand the basics of the column. How is it packed? How is it made? And this column, this handmade column, is very similar to the ordered column. There really is no difference between the two here, uh, except somebody else does all the packing for you, right? We order that from a company, the company packs the inside of it, they ship it to us, then we put it onto our instrument, and then we begin to use it. All of the pieces and components are typically the same on the inside of those ordered columns as they are on the handmade columns, okay? All right, so that's where this video is going to stop. Uh, in the next one, we'll just continue on with a little bit of the column theory, and we'll keep talking and discussing about chromatography until we get to the favorite part, 
which is equations.